Welcome to Elevating Consciousness, the podcast that helps you discover deeper levels of truth, meaning, and wholeness. I'm your host, Artem Zen, and today's guest is an internationally known expert in adult development and self-actualization. She received her doctorate in human development and psychology from Harvard. Her groundbreaking work with ego development theory looks at the relationship between self-story and meaning-making. She currently serves as a strategic advisor and research director of Vertical Development Academy, which facilitates leadership maturity in individuals, teams, and organizations. Suzanne Kagruder, welcome to the show. Hello, Artem. Uh, thanks for the invite, and let's see what can happen today. Awesome. I'm excited. So I'd like to begin... Um, by asking if you can give us a little background of how you got into developmental psychology in the first place. I was trained as a semanticist, a linguist looking at language in Europe, in Switzerland. And when I immigrated to the United States in 76, I had a hard time having my foreign degrees accepted. That's mutual across the world countries protect their degrees and and won't let in others so I had to go back to school and I did uh, I was I guess intellectually confident enough to apply to Harvard and got in and did a master's and while I was there I had a course with now I forget the name that's part of my age is lots of name remembering is just not there maybe it will come anyway it's what is. Um, I had a course on adult development theories. And when I came across Lovinger, I will, it was like a marriage in heaven. It was my linguistics really background plus psychology that just worked for me. So I, you know, learned how to score and very quickly realized the later stages were inadequately represented both in Lovinger's theory and in the manuals that we used to score a test. And then I just started collecting and I was lucky I got some real beautiful late, late stage responses right from the beginning when I did research. So the idea was, let me see what I can collect. You need quite a bit of anything in order to make any kind of generalizations about it. And I started collecting on collecting by, I guess by 85, somebody who I did research for, I just sort of mentioned in passing, can I use the late stage ones responses if there are any, it's really if there are any, because most, uh, Ten, uh, sentence completion tests don't contain any. And that got to the, the, the information came to the person who actually directed that project. And he said, oh, you have to come to a conference. We have here one in Cambridge in, in a couple of months, two months, just come and tell us what you have figured out so far. And it was complete. I had no idea how to do that. <laughs> it was just, uh, you know, happenstance. So anyway, I showed up with my huge chart where, with, with everything on one big picture because I don't think necessarily linearly and had never learned yet how to do that. And Kohlberg was there and some other people whose opinion I really valued. And they all said, you're on to something, keep going. So I just kept going and I collected <laughs> data for 15 years before I went back to school again for a doctorate. Can you kind of expand a little bit on what the sentence completion test is and how your background in linguistics uh, was actually very helpful how that tied in with that? Because uh, semantics is really the study of the meaning of words and how they change over time or expand or how you differentiate between similar words, that kind of effort. And the sentence completion test is a short 
really relatively short test. You finish it in less than an hour. It has 36 stems or sentence beginnings or prompts, things like education or when a child won't join group activity or my, pe my father or a good boss. And the person just has to finish that sentence in that time. There's 36 of them. And from those, we can glean a lot, a lot of information about the person. It's amazing to me to this day, after 10,000 of them that I've done, how much I get to encounter a person behind those sentences, get a sense of who they are, what they enjoy, what bothers them, and most importantly, in terms of consciousness, what they cannot yet see, what's not on their radar because they have no words for it. They don't use any words. It's not there. It's not that they choose not to use it. It's just not on their horizon. And the later the consciousness, the more one can actually capture also in language. And at the same time, that's the biggest hind the hindrance because we're so, so, so deeply, deeply conditioned to use language to describe reality. And of course, reality is something else we can't describe it. You can never describe your experience just right now. I'm seeing that beautiful tree behind you. I see you, I mean, there's a whole bunch of experience. I have somebody rustle in the background. It, it, the moment you cannot describe mm -hmm. ever. I, that's my opinion because I'm a linguist, maybe. <laughs> Maybe others have other ideas. You can feel it, you can sense it. And because today is 11, 11, 11 o'clock, I actually want to tell a story. Please do. 20 years ago, I happened to be on my way from London to Bath to meet Peter Reason. And we were just trundling along the highway. I'm not familiar with the area. And suddenly I see Stonehenge on the right of myself. And I told the person who was driving, absolutely, I don't care about appointments. <laughs> Let's stop. I want to see this. So we stopped and we walked towards the stones. And there was a, a guard around it. There were police there. There were military there. And I hadn't made the connection that this is Armistice Day. So each year they have a celebration there. It was horrid weather with ice cold rain coming straight parallel rather than from the top. There was a band there and we had little thingies to sing the songs that they were singing. But there was also allowed a circle of people, just one directly at the stones with the backs to the stones. And it was one of the most transcendent experiences I've ever had. Uh, the stones become, became pillars of light and the sense of the poor, poor soldiers who had been in these trenches in this kind of weather uh, changed my attitude towards the military or at least towards soldiers in some ways. I'm more of a pacifist. I don't understand why we do have to have wars and all that. But at that moment, I felt just touched for all those who sacrificed in that way, in that kind of condition. It was an unearthly experience and purely on intuition. I had no plan, I didn't even know it was there. That was the funny thing. I was <laughs> surprised to see it in the first place. Yeah. So and you... so rational and research and all of that, then there is this other side where sometimes things are being gifted to you or experiences come you have no control over. They just come, they just happen. 
And I think that's important to remember. I really love that you're sharing this because, um, you know, a lot of, of this kind of research and this kind of work, it's like very much on paper and it's, it's tied up to language. And then you're mentioning, you know, reality and how reality if you know, it, it's, it's separate. And um, I just had um, my, on my last podcast, I had, had um, Professor Chris Neubauer, and he's uh, he works with left and right brain differences. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we were just talking about how the left brain is like responsible for language and uh, for the ego structure. And then the right brain is like responsible for meaning and how we can't really put meaning into words. We just know it. And it's such a like fundamental and important part of life. Um, so it's just interesting to see this kind of dynamic and how it plays out and how. In different people. Yes. I would say probably there has to be some alertness to these kinds of other influences. If you just ignore them, if you're really in the Western mind, you know, anything that could be slightly spiritual or not explained it doesn't exist. We just don't look at it. If you have that attitude, you won't have experiences or you dismiss them. And the other issue is, of course, so many people do have such moment, peak moments or unusual experiences. And they tend to be that that is based on research. They tend then to talk about it from the level of maturity that they have already gained and reduce, naturally filter out, reduce what they what is not there for them to yet contemplate. That's, that's also interesting. Um, um, so, so something that's, I kind of wanted to bring this up later, but it just feels relevant right now. Something that's been uh, very transformational for me is um, using psychedelics, and mm -hmm. and I've had very profound experiences, but it's just interesting to see how these experiences are, are different for everybody, and for mm -hmm. some people they could be very transformational and and profound, and for others not so much, and also just just talking to people like how was your experience, and then how was your experience of this, and just seeing how it's so different. Um, yeah. and that a lot of times we're confused. We think that it's just, everybody should have the same kind of experience or the same kind of understanding. Uh, and then it, it just varies. And that's also true for if you test people and they, oh, let's say 10 people test at the same level, when you then talk to them in a debrief or in a coaching session, the experience itself is can be vastly different. Even so they test at the same level. So I wanted to ask you about like what was missing from Jane Lavinger's uh, theory. And, and you said that she wasn't exactly accurate on like the later stages. And was this because she was just not running into people at that time that were at those stages? Or what was it that you kind of added or you saw that she didn't see. May I correct you just a little bit? It's not an either or situation. It's oh. a both and. Yes, she yes. didn't have the data, I think, mm -hmm. but they also didn't look for it. Mm -hmm. And she really kind of dismissed anything that sounded later. Once she told me I was in the stratosphere, you know, sort of really dismissive. Uh, and then later she said also, unless you can prove it, you know, I don't, that, that to me is just wishy-washy stuff, all the later stages. So they didn't have the data and I don't think she really ever understood it. That kind of view of reality that I thought was natural to me. Um, and perhaps from my upbringing in Europe as well. Um, the, she just rejected it. And she was a tough customer. I mean, I learned a lot from her just by her toughness. Um, yeah. Didn't, 
didn't want me to do what I did. <laughs> so would you would you equate toughness with uh, stubbornness or, or kind of like a rigidity kind of being being in a certain paradigm and then you were move you were trying to show her a new paradigm and 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 what was it exactly that you were seeing that was different just that that, that there is development beyond the her highest stage is when you know yourself the most the best deeply and I say there, there is possibilities that you can go beyond self-knowledge, where you can deconstruct all the knowledge, including your identity. And I had examples for that, where people, you know, say that about themselves. I don't no longer care about identity. I just trundle along, experience what comes my way as openly as I can. I'm just inventing a, a response to I am. Very, very different than what she thought was the highest possible self-identity. Uh, it, it's a subtle, subtle differences, but it just struck me as that can't be enough. That can't be all of it. Um, and, you know, I thought because I had enough data, rare data, I could actually prove, as you can prove anything, that there might be a pattern in these late the responses that can be described as a stage or more than one stage. Yeah. What, what were some of the responses of, um, you know, those people that you've come into contact and that you've mapped and being the higher stages of development? Like, what were their responses in, in regards to their identity? How were they describing themselves and their place in the world? That they have been able to come to the conclusion that all the identities they have had over a lifetime or, you know, that they're an illusion. And that, it, that it, a lot of it, certainly these are mostly Western uh, responses, that they feel programmed. We get programmed to see ourselves in a certain way, manipulated, if you will, by the culture <laughs> to see, because we can't help it. We all go to school, we all get lose our child innocence, the not knowing that what's the word really means. The, the, lip, the free, the playful, the creative, it gets very quickly uh, stamped out or so modified, so dulled that once we're done with school, <laughs> cool, most of us have forgotten how to be free, how to play, how to just not feel all the obligations we now do feel because that's what's expected of an adult. Definitely resonates the whole, uh, <laughs> the whole playing and serious thing. That's like a polarity that's very alive in me. Um, so would you say that identity is the central issue in human development? Is that really like the main thing that we're working from my perspective, From my perspective, yes. You can be, and, and to become aware how you're attached. I just had an incident yesterday where I realized I have an attachment to something, the, to see myself in a certain way uh, that can be let go of. And that's hard, it's hard when you have a self sense of something and then you have to say well maybe that's just an attachment to a particular you know usually idealized that's what the ego does it, it wants to tell a good story so it tells a good story about whatever how would you how do you explain or define the ego because that's one of the most fascinating to me uh, things to me is like how can we even speak about the ego well there is again it is the dilemma of the semanticist there is no such thing as an ego there's no such thing as any of these abstractions that we saw spirit these are all ways of how human beings try to capture pull out 
of the seamless whole something and then give it a name and then we think oh we understand what that means don't we you and i mean the same thing when we say that and of course no two not even if it's a concrete thing like a tree there's no two trees in the world that are identical but we just think we know what we're talking about and it works i mean we couldn't learn we couldn't communicate we couldn't grow up if we didn't have some common language. But to become aware how that is really, really separating us from the underlying experience is a late stage discovery, I think. And it makes me think about objectivity and, and how, does, how does that change as a person develops? And, um, in the sense of I'm perceiving objective reality or this, this is objective. How does that change as a person develops? That's actually a very clear shift from the conventional, what we call, you know, the three, la three layers, con pre-conventional, conventional, post-conventional. Post and if you want to add transcendent experiences or self views, views of reality. Uh, the shift from conventional to post-conventional is precisely at that point. It is one of the things that shifts. Before we believe, again, growing up in the Western world with the scientific method and all of that, and the fabulous things that we have found out and still figure out using that method. When we had early in the last century, the discoveries of quantum physics, and sort of cosmologies that being able to have telescopes that can see worlds and worlds behind, they, they became for at least some part of uh, humanity or researchers or the academic world, they became the, the acknowledgement that we can't, there's nothing in the world we can look at, no matter what, how marvelous our tools there's always an interpreter behind it. There is no objective reality. Things move and we're always interpreting. And that doesn't mean that certain wonderful discoveries are, are useful in certain context. I believe in gravity. I believe in gravity even in the sense that I puzzle or it's fascinating to imagine imagine the anthropodes the people are on the other side of our globe they, they wouldn't they have to be upside down how can they live that way <laughs> you know if you play that's the place for side in in science that's also possible then you have this isn't that fascinating or the whole idea of mapping have you seen a map that's upside down that actually depicts, let's say, Africa on top and Europe and all that on the bottom? We always depict it the same way with the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern. But the Earth is a ball that goes through the cosmos in any which way, it turns extremely fast. Uh, there's no upside and downside or left or right, unless you define it as such. If you take yourself as the center and then define the directions. You there's you so many fabulous things that have to do with, with that kind of play and awareness. Yeah, that's beautiful. You you mentioned the uh, you mentioned gravity, so maybe it's a good uh, point to to explain um, what the center of gravity is in ego development th theory. It is we would define it as that place from which I automatically and regularly can look at the world. That doesn't mean that's the only place I can look at. Sometimes, certainly under stress, and we've seen that with COVID for all of us, I almost think we can uh, fall back 
we relate, you know, we use earlier ways of looking at the world. And there is always the possibilities that in certain moments, we get a glimpse of something that's more mature than where I normally make sense of things. In the company of more evolved others, sometimes you get that to special experiences like the Stonehenge one for me. It shifts something and then you have a sense there is another possibility. Like I don't actually have to reject everything that has to do with the military. There are things that I can relate to. That's a shift that has not turned back. That's a real shift, a real opening. But often we have these experiences and then we go right back to where we normally operate. So the center of gravity is that place from which I generally see the world and explain my, the world to myself and myself to myself. This is who I am. This is what reality is. This is what's important to me or those around me as well. So people, people basically uh, are dispersed over several stages. Nobody is at one stage 100% of the time. I've never found a single, I mean, again, that's just basing it on the test, but I've never found a person who is at one stage. And if one, somebody, we occasionally have three, uh, that is already narrow. That means the person is somehow uh, constrained in a way. The highest levels are also the ones who have the biggest spread because they're free. They can get angry and show it in a, in a response. They don't have to control everything. So can you explain the role environment plays in human development and also what are the critical aspects of an environment that are most conducive for growth? For one thing, human beings tend to grow no matter what. They, there's, there is difficulties we all have to face. It helps if you have some adults around you when you're little that actually have some control over their emotions, for instance, that care about you and make you feel worthy to be alive, to be here, to be, you know, not just a burden or a difficulty or that helps. It helps all along if you have others who uh, listen to you. I think that part of being seen or heard is incredibly important. And the environment, of course, if you live in, 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 dire contexts, war uh, zones, uh, with so many now natural disasters and you've never seen anything else. That's the survival kind of energy you are around from little on and you never get to see anything else. I think then it's hard to develop beyond some very early forms of human survival. So I'm curious, um, you know, I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but I'm, I'm curious of your opinion of psychedelics or your experience of them and how they can can help with a person's development or if, if they can, in your opinion. I have, other than a bit of hashish when we were 20, in our 20, 50 years ago, <laughs> where it was... I lived in a student uh, community and it was in everything. And yeah, I have some memories of that. I complained to a teacher of mine and that I didn't really, everybody else was, you know, listening to music and sort of lying there all happy. And I didn't, I, I was kind of bored. And I was concerned about that. What's missing in me if I can't follow <laughs> this kind of thing? And the person wisely said, you know, don't, don't worry about it. 
uh, that just you probably might be more rational or have a harder time breaching that thing. And recently I've heard a lot of people I care about and know have taken psychedelics and have all had fabulous experiences. I have not yet. And I, I can't say more, I'm older. I already have some medical issues that I asked my doctors whether I should, and they say, mm, probably not, but I'm incredibly curious. I love that you said, as of yet, you know, I love that you left that as an open end. Um, Michael, I'm not sure if you heard of Michael Pollan, um, but he's a writer and a journalist, and he wrote the book, How to Change Your Mind. And he's also later in life, and he had all these experiences. Um, so it's just interesting to see um, somebody later in life using these and just seeing how it ex expands their uh, vision of of it but it seems like it seems like um there's just so much that you've been able to tap into in, in reality through just whether it's studying psychology or whether it's your own intuitive sense or like the experience with the stonehenge that um yeah maybe you're able to get in insights that other people can't without using something like that that just reminds me of something. So I was watching, uh, I think it was on public television, an, a segment on on drugs and psychedelics and mushrooms. No, it was on Netflix on mushrooms. And they had some images there that are obviously computer generated. But I said, oh my God, all my life I've been waiting to see something in the external world that I see in my inner mind in my head and I've always looked sort of tile uh, Arabic tile structures for instance have some of that quality but they're they're steady they don't move these images actually move they are organic they're uh, I've always been able to do that since a child and only once did I do a piece of research with Howard Gardner at uh, at the Ed School at Harvard. And again, most people I interviewed see maybe black and white or little things. Mostly it's a phenomenon that's described from migraine uh, people, unfortunately. But mine is just pure, pure uh, <laughs> joy. <laughs> can be easily, sometimes children can do it, you know, when you're on your school desk and you put your head down and you put your eyes on your arm and there's a little pressure. Some people get the, some visual uh, activation that way, but mine seem to have been more beautiful, more, I, I can't describe it, except I saw those pictures. And so that's the closest I've ever seen to anything that I see. These were totally, uh, symmetrical round what do you call it? concentric symmetrical these like oh, you're talking about like fractals right is this like these well like fractals fract would be something like that yes and but they move they, yeah. they constantly move beautiful hues they're so beautiful I, I i was looking for it in the external world and couldn't really find it yes i can find beauty anywhere i look a little flower, a dust, speck of dust that is hit by the sunshine, you know, a beam, something like that. But these other, these inner things are far more complex. And <laughs> what can I say? So I've had access to interesting things, I guess. And I've yeah. always as a rationalist, as a realist, I've always said, wonderful, it's amazing what the human brain can concoct. But it doesn't mean I'm spiritual or any of that stuff. Yeah, the, the whole idea of being spiritual or something being spiritual or something not being spiritual, that's just something that's very interesting to me and that's been popping up a lot in uh, my own life. Uh, you know, in my experience, nothing is nothing 
either everything is spiritual or nothing is spiritual. You can't separate anything or fragment that's, it. That's the, the point. There's no need to make that separation. And I found out on, on perhaps in reaction to a lot of, I don't know, shall I say it? Yes, I can say it. I'm old enough. Integral. There's so many people there and there's so many people now that aim for some sort of ego transcendence and it's all ego driven. Yes. Not actually free. I, I think the term for it is spiritual materialism. Yes. That's and um, I'm a bypassing. I'm guilty. Yes. I'm very guilty. I, 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 I'm sure I've done a lot of that and probably still doing a lot of that. And it, it seems to be, a, it also seems to be like a part of the natural process of yes the ego to withering itself to away. That. Yes, to go the same with ego development. You actually have to go through, Engler said it most beautifully in that book, early book by Ken and Engler and Brown. What's it called? The something of transformations of consciousness mm. i just did a retreat with dan brown i did a meditation oh, okay. retreat with him yeah he's 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 fascinating he, unfortunately he has parkinson's so his, yes. his health is declining but uh but yeah that, that that he did that book a long time ago with ken wilbur and he said something there that again struck me completely as absolutely something that i could resonate with name you have to have an ego in order to let it go. You can't be an immature ego to let it go because otherwise you do the bypassing. For at least from the Western perspective. And we see that in some of the East, uh, Eastern traditions, the, the monks there, they may really have incredible access to transcendent experiences and understanding of reality. But when it comes to ordinary life, they falter. They don't know what to do with, you know, think of Trungpa and his misbehavior, all that kind of thing. They, because they haven't been doing both. We're trying to do both now. We're trying to get a sense of the transcendent and at the same time also grow up. Yeah, it's that, um, how do you integrate, you know, insights into, you know, the abs potential absolute reality and, and then relative reality and how do you bridge that gap and somebody that's had these insights into awakening and, and it's just like, oh, everything's an illusion. So I can just do whatever I want because everything's- That's an, an immature response to, because with, yeah greater uh, maturity comes more responsibility more caring more compassion more discerning when to act when not to act when to say yes and when to say no here's a boundary uh, that that is you don't learn that necessarily when you have great spiritual awareness that everything is all is interconnected, you know, all of that. If you look at Zen, you know, there is no self, no self. Uh, depends a bit on the tradition of what's uh, stressed as important, but you don't necessarily grow up that way. That's, that's like, that seems to be the missing piece that at least like with integral theory it's just wake up grow up show up clean up it's all a good thing cleaning up is good i mean yes we we all may have mistakes we're just human we're mortals we have clay feet and angel wings but the clay feet is what gets us into trouble and we all have them how could we not as I said earlier, we we're all programmed in certain ways, first from our families and their values and their ways of doing things, and then from school and then from the culture as a whole. I mean, we live in a, you know, what kind of culture we live in. Commercialism and consumerism to the nth degree. Uh, you, you need it now, you can't, you know, we, we give you money so you can 
buy it now and then you can pay back later, that kind of, but the whole culture is like that, celebrity worship, because we don't have, people don't have much meaning anymore. So they try to, I don't know whether that's true, but that's my sense. They're trying to live through the lives, the glamorous lives of others. They always smile at sport team stuff. You know, the Boston team. You're in New York. Where are you? Yeah, I'm in New York. But in anyway, Europe. you are your team. So I don't know how you're a sports fan. It just seems, um, to me, it's still always surprising when the Boston teams win, the whole, the whole area lights up. And when they lose, there is a, a literal pal over the, <laughs> the area of depression and disappointment. It, it just doesn't compute for me at all. <laughs> Yeah, well, well, at your at your stage of development, that's it's just different. Uh, but like, I I'm not a fan of sports at all. I find I rather play sports myself than watch sports. That's another thing. That's fine. <laughs> I would kick yeah. ball, yeah. but not to this kind of identification that people have with the success and the failures of these teams. That just is a puzzle to me. And yet. Do you know what? I think it's the same old that we have from ancient times, the bread and games. Paniet Circus, you know, the, the, the way how you keep the masses uh, happy in a way, entertained, engaged. And I, I'm, you make me, no, you don't make me, I make myself rattle on. <laughs> on all kinds of things that, that I wonder about. Yeah, please do. Uh, this is a platform for you to express yourself and to share your ideas and your perspectives, which are uh, highly appreciated and valued. Um, something that was coming up and now it's, it's, it's leaving. <laughs> um, I, I, yeah, I have so many questions. So uh, can you talk about what are some of the most important polarities that all humans have to manage in your experience? In breath and out breath. Try for, <laughs> try not to <laughs> do it for a minute and what happens? I don't feel like I have to manage that one. It just, that one manages <laughs> it on itself. <laughs> it does, but it is a fundamental polarity if you want fundamental. Uh, activity and rest. We all need to sleep, and that that would be a fundamental one. Belonging and being able to be separate in a good way, not be dependent so much totally on on others, but have parts of ourselves that we can carry for ourselves, and at the same time we need to belong to some things, to in order to thrive as human beings. Um, what the, I would say idealism and realism, both of them. If you just have one, there's something missing, either of them. Practical, that it's similar to ideas and pra you know, practicality. Both need to be attended to, both need over time need to be balanced or not, not at the moment, but overall in the longer term, you need ac access to both. How is ego development theory different and the same as other developmental theories that exist now? Um, you know, spiral dynamics, integral theory, uh, Robert Keegan's uh, evolving self model. They, they each have their specialties in which they're very strong. Uh, dyna but spiral dynamics is probably my least favorite, but it often is an door opener for people who've never heard or thought of development. 
because it's relatively simple. It's, that's also part of his problem, but it is a, a way of entering this whole idea that adults develop. Um, most of the other theories folk don't, don't focus on the meaning maker so much. They don't see the ego as the storyteller. It, it could be another word. It could be the self as storyteller. I just chose it because it distinguishes from the other theories that way. Uh, most of them are more rational, more abstract. So for instance, uh, lectica, where their intention is really to help people grow along their idea of what the developmental path is, very strongly uh, focused on that. Higher is better. That's the other thing that is different. We don't say higher is better. For one, we don't say higher and lower. We say earlier and later. Because again, words have power. And in our culture, higher is better. It is better. Higher numbers, higher returns on investment, higher grades, whatever it is, higher the word, higher itself frames reality in such a way that it is tempting to believe higher is better. It's always better. Sometimes it is, sometimes more complex thinking is definitely necessary. Global warming or the current, all the current difficulties we are aware of, we, uh, certainly helps to have a more complex, more, uh, what's the word? A synthetic, a, a bigger mind, that is true. But in individual lives, I don't think it matters so much. The good people everywhere, almost everywhere, certainly starting with conventional and even with pre-conventional kinds of ways of looking at the world can be positive. In the West, we mostly see the negative sides of it, but it could in earlier cultures, in the indigenous cultures, that are less separated from, uh, from nature, for instance, who don't see themselves as superior in all ways that we do. I'm not sure that that's uh, a sign of lesser, of primitive, of all of that. And then we all know people at later stages who are not very good people when it comes to what I would call just basic goodness. Yeah, they can do marvelous things with their heads and they can speak about things, you know, what we call, what I call aboutism. They can be marvelously explaining <laughs> complex things, but it doesn't penetrate to their own way of being in the world. I can see that. I, I was wondering though, how does, uh, how do you, how do we, because this is something that Ken Wilber talks a lot about um, hierarchies and then growth and oppression hierarchies. And you're on, if you could kind of unpack that a little bit in your understanding of that. That there is oppression, but I would say even our acculturation in the West is a, a kind of oppression. That's why I earlier talked about freedom, the freedom to play, the freedom to not follow all these dictates and goals. And, you know, what's, uh, what's the word? It's held in front of us as that's what we should be. That makes life worthwhile living. More of this, more of that, faster, bigger, uh, <laughs> which may not be the case. That, that's just, that is a part of where we are being lied to so much that we actually don't have another view of how things could be. So do you see, so do you think that there isn't a better, it's only a later, but it's not a better, because there's still this sense of like, 
okay, we kind of want to get over here. I'm dealing with this problem over here and I'm still stuck at this stage of consciousness and I'm struggling and I'm dealing with these polarities and I, I want to get to that next stage so I can solve these problems. <laughs> uh, perhaps the struggle again is in itself psychoactive as Ken would say, or many would say, but the, the, the fantasy that once you went to the next level, it will be gone. It, maybe that particular issue will be gone, but there will be new ones. Because the later you are, the more you see both the good and the bad. And the in between, you see more. And Ken says it beautiful, and I always forget how to cite him. It uh, bothers you less. I forget. But it hurts more or something like that? <laughs> yes, I wish I could, could correctly uh, cite it because it's that, that's again a, something he absolutely hit the nail. You see more and you, in some ways you, you suffer more, but it bothers you less because it's part of existence. It's part of being a, an aware, aware person. You see the suffering in others and you see the, the, your own struggles and limitations. And then you say, yes, okay, that's being human. It's like um, just an, it's a, like a greater tolerance to embrace more, more experience, more, pola uh, more oh. polarities, more paradox. All of it, yes. More ambivalence. Um, I just, I don't know. Yeah, I can tell you. It's just another story because it just happened. So uh, on my birthday a couple of years ago, a colleague of mine from Australia came by and brought me a nodule. A nodule is from 4,000 meters down in the ocean. They're now trying to harvest those nodules because they're made up of elements that are rare. We have explored, we've used all up on, on the surface. What is and that? What is that? Is this uh, some kind of a rock? What is it? I'm sorry, I never heard it's the It's like term. a rock. It's about fist size. The one he brought me, there may be bigger ones and smaller. So it's a fist size black kind of object made up of multiple elements that there seems to be millions or tons and tons and tons on the bottom of the ocean in some of those deepest trenches. They're now trying to uh, harvest those because we've run out of so many of the very precious metals and they contain them. And so as happy as I am every time I see that object, wrote to him today, I finger it, I don't hold it. And the fingering it has to do with my ambivalence about even having it and even doing that sort of thing. Exploiting nature for human, you know, expansion. It's an issue, it's a, it's a problem that we deeply have. And I cannot imagine my life without my cell phone, which of course has some of those minerals, <laughs> elements in it. it. It's, yeah, so how do I live with it? Yeah, I admire the human energy and spirit that explores. And I am sad about what we have actually come to in our exploitation and destruction of the globe or the, our home place. Yeah, that, that uh, brings up something for me. Um, yeah, I have two kids and um, this past weekend we went to uh, uh, another kid's birthday and we went to this like farm and you see these animals and you feed them and, and, and just, like coming there is just so surreal to me because it's like all these animals that are kind of being held and caged in just for our own amusement and entertainment. 
And, you know, obviously it's like, I have to put that aside because I'm here and what am I going to do? Yeah. Pro- yeah. yeah. Protest it. But, but, but if I really feel on a deeper level, it's like, I don't want to be contributing to this. Like this, it doesn't resonate with me. It doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel like this is the only way that we can enjoy life. Like it just feels like a very like condition, like the conditioning it you is. were speaking about. Yes. So then once you're aware of the conditioning, then the, the next challenge is how do I live with it? To which degree do I reject the conditioning and say, I'm just not going to do that anymore. I won't, you know, go to a, uh, an animal park with my children. That doesn't make sense either, does it? Because they're not naturally going to encounter those creatures and you want them to get a sense of, of them, a love for them, develop a love for, for that. Yeah, so then we have to just hear the word hold is the correct word. <laughs> it's not like the, 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 it was so visceral to me to hold that that stone and not wanting to fully hold it because it, it's loaded with uh, yeah, with precious metals and it's loaded with ambivalence. Yeah, I, I love it that you have that kind of sensitivity to feel that way towards a stone, because I feel like most people don't even feel that way towards other people, but to to feel that way to to a stone is like there's like a immense sensitivity. So, so it, it's it seems that in most developmental theories, um, there is what is considered the critical shift. And I believe in Robert Keegan's model, that shift is from socialized mind to self-authoring mind. And in integral theory, that shift is from postmodern into integral consciousness or second tier thinking. So what is the critical shift in uh, EDT and how did you come to determine that as being the most significant turning point in human development? The, the shift from what we call stage four and f- to four or five. I wish I could show you the image I have on my other screen here because it's, you know, have you seen the arc image? Absolutely, I have it. Spare? I have it on my. I have it on my screen right now. Yeah. Any, okay. Anyway, there you can see the shift, the middle up to stage four. You'd actually develop an identity. You develop. You separate yourself from your initial state as a, in utro, you know, as a totally se- inseparate, connected being. So you develop this more and more separations in science as well, you know, logic or objectivity, all of that. And then comes the shift to the post-conventional, which means you become aware of how you have been acculturated, socialized programmed, I like to say. Domesticated is another word. We're all domesticated in a certain mindset. Western, you know, that kind of thing. And it, 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 it opens up wide the door of what's possible than what's possible before. So that is the main shift. There's another shift at five or integral. That's the first time you can actually look back generally and fully appreciate, ideally, that's an ideal. I don't see it happen very often. Appreciate all the levels that come before. See the beauty of them as well. And that's, Keegan is totally right when it comes to just at the percent, look at the percentages. The work we have to do is in the conventional to help people get out of the very early stages if we find that a useful uh, goal or if the people themselves have the drive and say, I wish I could see more like like my boss, for instance. I'm so stuck in my way of how I'm doing things. I wish that could be different. The work is there in the world, not, not in the later stages. That happens, we always say in ego development, um, 
if you're at home, wherever you are, if you're integrated enough there, then growth will happen naturally. It's not a goal. It's an outcome of living consciously and well, wherever you are. It doesn't have to be complex. Yeah, I, I see that that shift, right? From increasing independence and knowledge and moving from four to four five, where now we're increasing interdependence and maturity. And the conventional stages, the approximation is about 80% mm -hmm. of, of the population. And then the people moving into post-conventional, it's 15 to 20%. So it seems like the majority of the people are in conventional still. Um, what, how do we make developmental stage theories more accessible? How do we, it, it, can, like, what are the type of people that are even, like, what stages are even interested in this that are even looking, right? Because this seems to be like a self-questioning thing. You have to start questioning yourself to even look at ego development theory. That is one of the ironies, yes. I think stage four you know, an objective uh, real, uh, kind of adult. Now adulthood is defined in the West. Piaget uh, and others Swiss, you know, he, his adulthood was formal operations, what stage four thinking capacity. And I, I don't know whether he, if he had researched it, he, whether he would have focused on later stages as well. He didn't because he studied how children develop. And he discovered that there are patterns in there before, before him, uh, children were seen as unfinished adults, not children, not developing in their own right in, in predictable patterns. So f at stage five, you can see that both within yourself and ideally in, in other people so that you can respect somebody who is at an earlier stage and see and, and love and care because another aspect of ego development theory would be the, what we say in French, noblesse oblige. When you have the capacity, then you're obligated. It's your responsibility to care and to love. You can't expect it back from the other. So you see more, but you also have more responsibility to lay to the stage. What's been coming, kind of what's been coming up for me a lot is that with, with great privilege comes great power. And, and with great power, there's this, the universe is telling you like, you need to take this responsibility upon yourself. Yes. You, and, and, and that, that I feel like is the challenge. The challenge is for people that are at higher stages of development, it's how do you stay patient? How do you stay humble? How do you, you know, recognize that you're actually very lucky to yes. even, because you're not, you're not separate and everything around you molded you and brought you to where you are. Yes. You're not a self-made man. That whole idea is so almost ridiculous. That always, when, whenever I hear that, I'm self-made. That that always like, it, it just it always it, felt so like ah oh, that how can you say that how how are you self-made like what does that mean? There's you can't do everything by yourself. No, no, none of us. We're all totally dependent on others and on environments and on the infrastructure, whatever you want. There's no none of that. Yes, and yes, we're taught, and yet but again the. Recl reclame what's that in english advertisement the whole the whole scene um tells you you have to have these things and you are independent don't don't listen to these others you make up your own mind if i can do it you can do it like, that's one of the ones that gets me when the other you know that sort of thing maybe or maybe not yeah, that that also that that's um that that pull your pull yourself up by the bootstrings like and if I could do it you can do it and using outliers and people that overcame insane difficulty and it's like well he did it so you should be able to do it too 
Yes, that's part of that, how we get bamboozled. And when you hear that all your life and you never hear anything else, then of course you believe it. It's also that those who do it get rewarded and those who don't, usually the post conventional quite often, you don't get rewarded because you're not, uh, draw, what's it called? Pulling the party, no, not pulling the party line. The consumerism, etc., party line. You said uh, reklama, uh, and yes. um, I that that's I, I speak Russian, so in in Russian, that's uh, reklama means uh, it's like an advertisement. Is yes, is that where you're getting reklama? Or is that also because I, I believe you you're originally from Switzerland? So yes. is that is that how you also say reklama? Absolutely, in Swiss? that's the word that comes. And one thing that's interesting to me linguistically is. As I get older and my memory is not as good, now quite often the word first comes in, into my mind in German, Swiss German, and then I have to kind of look for what is it. I know it in English, of course I do, but I've, the, the older language seems to resurface for some reason when your current mind starts to show some <laughs> lacunae, some. <laughs> <laughs> do you think in um do you think in swiss is that is that your first language is that the no, language you yes no i think in english mm. but that, that's what i observed that as i get older the more words come first in that way just yeah curious i don't know what to have whether it's a, needs even an explanation it's just what it is Excuse me. So I'm kind of curious about what you're up to now. Uh, and, you know, maybe you could explain wh what is Veda and what is the work that you're doing with them? I'm just now I'm retired. I'm no longer part of the company. I'm an advisor, if you will. I'm still sort of responsible for or feel I should make sure that it's uh, the way I hope the theory is being held in primarily. And I think Bina Sharma, who is the director, he's totally in that sense. I trust her completely that she holds theories lightly and does not overpromise in the sense of, oh, everybody, we can help you grow in, in you know, we, we help people grow, make them more aware of how they approach coaching, how they uh, live their own lives, how they find answers to their questions. But we don't stress that we don't think you, you can create the container for people to grow, you can actually make them grow. I don't think they need to want to and the circumstances have to be right and the attitude has to be right. And I find a lot of, in the developmental, vertical development area, I find a lot of an attitude that I can't quite share. And is this the attitude of superiority? Mm -hmm. I'm better than? Yes, all of that. And I need it. I'm not good enough without it. Yeah, that's a scarcity that's... mindset rather than an abundant one. So I'm 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 curious. Um, you know, I've been looking into this the the vertical development for myself, and uh, looking into leadership maturity profile, which is I believe the test, and it's it's an expensive test. And it is. You know what? How many hours it takes even an experienced person to score one takes and then writing the comments. It's really the comments that, that take up so much time. Three, three, three and a half hours each. And we're dealing with highly educated, you know, certified uh, people who are at later stages or they couldn't do the work. You know, it just takes that much. 
I guess I'm wondering, because you kind of mentioned like only the person can could really grow. But I'm just wondering how much can something like this um, help or facilitate somebody's development? Um, you know, I guess there, I guess there's a little bit of skepticism. There's a part of me that believes in it. And that's like, okay, this would be great. But, but I can see how like maybe doing the coaching and having that, those. That, it, it comes with the expensive comes with a debrief. And I always feel that the debrief is the real place where one can then explore with the client and listen to how they make sense of things. And they get to read their profile. And there's lots of good information that they can use and hints and questions that are useful. But the, the, the real work or the real is the contact, the encounter with the person in the coaching, in the debrief situation. So is there any way to make this more accessible for the average person. Cause you know, most people are not gonna dish out this, this money or, you know, if, even if you take the test and then you wanted to do the coaching on top of that, that's even more. Um, so so yeah. there, you can read about it. So many people now read and hear about it. Uh, I'm in the process of writing a book. Mm. I'm writing two books. One is the, the final <laughs> swan song of mine in terms of ego development. That is with the editor at the moment and I'm eagerly waiting to see what she's done. It was so big, she, we decided needed serious surgery and she has it in her hands. The other book I'm writing with a colleague in Sydney he is half my age. He is what I call a, a, a magician. And since we met, I felt that way about him. Um, he is the head of the Street University, which is an institution in Australia where they bring delinquent kids into environments where they can actually learn to be socialized and, and more positive. And it's, it's a fairly big organization and they, they have residential facilities. Uh, they have what's called the street university. And he's been using eco-development theory with his teams, with his leadership teams for many years now. And he's one of those things that Keegan would call a deliberately developmental organization, where that developing the people up there, there is part of the mandate of the whole organization. And he once came and visited me and we did a walk around Walden Pond. I live five minutes from it in that area and the wooded little ponds all over, not just Walden Pond. And we had this idea that um, we would write a fable so that even children perhaps could read it or certainly anybody who is an adult. And the idea is such, I'm the resident old owl. I don't travel anymore. I'm too old. I'm just having my spot in, in the wood. And he is the traveling otter. He's a youngster who is full of adventure and just goes through, through the world having adventures. And we're starting to talk. And I realize, you know, I'm looking sometimes, I have a few mentees, people I'm, I'm supporting in, in their growth by really giving them a lot of time and talking to them. So we're doing that. I'm, I'm convincing this author to stay for a week and that I will introduce them to the, the creatures around the pond, that resident pea, so that they can get an experience of different ways of how people, how they make sense of things. And so far we have done the fox and, and the bees. 
And of course, you have to be careful because foxes are, again, animals. If you do fables, you have to be careful. It easily becomes a caricature that isn't true. So we're actually emphasizing the positive energies of each. What they actually bring to the world. And the idea, we're well, not further yet, the idea at the end is to have a party at the beach, the Walden Pond has a beach where people uh, with sand, we will have a goodbye party there and everybody will come together and we will create some kind of manifesto of how to live peaceably with each other. It's a wonderful, playful, just the kind of thing that I love to do now. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. And to me, uh, that reminds me of, you know, kind of what you were talking about in our emails about honoring all stages. And I really love that you're applying this to animals and kind of trying to see the beauty in, in every single creature, no matter how big or how small and how the role they're playing is just as vital. Uh, I think we have this uh, propensity to, you know, you see somebody like Jeff Be Bezos or Elon Musk, and like, oh, this person is changing the world. This person is doing something that's so amazing. And then we kind of overlook how important other roles that maybe don't look as flashy or as flamboyant. Just a mother that's wholeheartedly taking care of her child and nobody knows her. She's not in the spotlight. And yet her role is just as important as, you know, somebody like Elon Musk. But in our mind, we create this kind of like, this is more important, that's more important. Well, because again, the advertisement and the, 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 kind of, yeah, the whole public thing gives us, shows us those people and puts them up as heroes. And the mother who is a hero in her own small daily way is, is, doesn't get any coverage. Yeah, without the bees, like we wouldn't be here without the bees, how vital they are <laughs> oh, to our... Yes bees yeah. the mushrooms all these things that we step on kill overlook and they're vital for our life for our survival vital. yes well that's a separation where we think we're not part of them they, 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 we don't recognize now more and more you hear certainly on public television on certain nature shows you get to really beautiful images of what they can now actually photograph or just amazing. Is there anyone new in the field of de developmental psychology that you feel is contributing something significant to the evolution of this discipline? Anybody that you've ran across? Not really. There are new trends. There's, of course, the artificial intelligence trend to do, score, to do these tests, whatever, and, and, and offload them to artific artificial intelligence scoring. There is a trend, and to me, they belong together, but they're still separate in terms of looking at indigenous cultures and what what kinds of worldviews they have had and developed that actually would inform us about less of that distinction between self, other, us, and the, the nature, you know, that have a closer relationship. I don't mean going back to, to earlier times, but to the sentiments that they contain of the connection that we could certainly benefit from. There's a lot of wisdom that's just been covered over with Western ideas of what life is about and, and human beings are about. The idea of Ubuntu in Africa. Yeah. But the real, not the way we usually <laughs> adopt it here in the West, but the original ones, that, that, that to me is one way we can go to open up the Western mind, the weird mind, to include some of the wisdom of other cultures. 
this small attempt at that. And then the whole thing about virtues that's now getting big with the, have you heard of the inner development goals? Oh, what's that? I'm sorry. I'm not sure I have. <laughs> well, that's a, if you asked about no terrain. So here we go. There is uh, the Templeton Foundation. You know about them. They're the they support sort of spiritual research. Or... I just saw. I never knew about them, and I just had an ad shown to me a couple of days ago, and I saw they gave the latest one, the prize, to Jane Goodwill. Yeah. Good. Uh, yeah. So they also do uh, support research with serious funds, you know, millions. Uh, wow. And so they funding uh, together with the Excaret Foundation in Sweden, the two together found the inner development goals. So they have had uh, surveys, I think not quite across the world, but huge surveys about what do people feel are the most important values or uh, virtues. And we now have a list, I think, of 21 or 25 that have been selected by you know, statistics and pollsters. And now they're trying to, and what they found is if you find, create applications that actually help people people to understand and embrace those values. And they're neutral, they're not religious, also most of the bigger religions, uh, you know, have some of them, uh, or ancient values to me, like uh, Confucius with courage, you know, this, this is, and, and wisdom, and those are ancient. But I think more of that, included in in the frameworks is, is going to be important because now they're often just purely cognitive and they don't have that element and again it can be done at every level yeah this is uh this is interesting this this inner development thing you're speaking about and and highlighting what are the most important values I'm just curious how that would change because it seems that depending on where a person is at, uh, you know, just even going back to Mas Maslow and his hierarchy of needs, you know, if you're trying to put food on the plate and you're worrying about how you're going to pay the bills and have a roof over your head, what's important and what you value, um, I, I, I guess it could be different for than somebody who's doesn't have to worry about those things. And they're kind of now going more into the growth needs and-, and Sure, but anybody, you can find people, any situation, no matter how horrid a, a war concentration camp, there are people there who are courageous and who are generous. For instance, generosity is not dependent on stage. Yeah, I'm looking on um, on my uh, whiteboard in front of me, uh, and it says embody the six perfect uh, perfections, and this is from Buddhism, and it's uh, generosity, patience, ethics, diligence, concentration, wisdom, and I guess these kind of things are like fundamental. Yeah, they seem to be universal, and they can be not taught. Yeah, maybe even taught. They can you can help people be aware of them in a way that in schools in simple ways the difference between a courageous sharing and the fearful holding on to what you have and you know protecting it putting in boundaries and some of the indigenous cultures have far more of that we together have enough and we share and the sharing is, you know, when you're in need, I'll get, we sh with the, so a group we share with you. And then when you have, you share with us, it's, it's just a different mindset. A more generous mindset. It, Not it, the me, mine, mine, you know, stuff that we so 
get trained into, I think, about intellectual property too. What an insanity to call it intellectual property. We spoke earlier about the fact that we are stand on shoulders of generations of others. There's no, mm. <laughs> it, it, it can't be property in that way, but that's the legalistic way we have to function almost today. Yeah, it's interesting you brought up the intellectual property thing and, and what was popping up in my head. Um, there's this author, Charles Eisenstein. He's a thinker, a speaker also, and he he speaks about that in one of his books about like how intellectual property is ridiculous. And he also talks about the story of separation. And, and it's interesting. It seems like everything that I'm interested in and everything is like this recurring theme of identity and and this feeling how people feel that we're separate. And it seems like this is exactly what you're talking about and exactly what you're pointing out with ego development theory is this notion of, we feel like we're separate, but we're not. Well, and then that's the, the real growth of that edge between, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> probably time <laughs> four to four or five is to become aware that we are conditioned to see things in a certain way, deeply, deeply conditioned. It's hard to resist. If, I, if you don't believe in intellectual property now, actually that's a new trend too, the, the public, uh, the commons, commonwealth of research. There's uh, ResearchGate, and in Switzerland there is, I think it's called Springer, and they're both places where you can share your research and you don't get any money for it. It's just sharing. It's different than the old academic journal kind of things that are so expensive. And uh, then nobody reads it on, you know, you can't afford to read those things. This is freely available knowledge. That's a new shift as well. I think that would be good. Away from the yeah. property. Yeah, that makes me think of uh, Elon Musk and how he's like all, all the research he does, he's actually opens all that up. And he's like, here's the technology, here's take it and do something with it. And I, that's, that's how we're going to grow and evolve. That is actually part of that new, the edge of what I think is happening in, in our field. Yes. And that, I think it's good. It was high time to be, become a bit more aware of the overall, the whole fields have been conditioned, not just individuals. The academia as a field needs to open up and become more generous. I have, um, well, I have so many questions, but I have a couple more. <laughs> Uh, that I just want to ask you, and then I'll, I'll let you go have your lunch. Um, <laughs> so, well, this this is one that was coming up. I was just curious because you, you know, you've studied and you've developed this ego development theory, and you've worked with this your whole life. I'm just curious about your experience when you interact with people. Do you does your brain automatically start kind of mapping them out and 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 seeing like based on how they respond and the language they use, kind of getting a sense of where they're at? Does it happen automatically? Is it something you turn on and turn off? Like, how does that process work for you? Because I noticed just learning as I'm learning ego development theory, I started just by people walking by in the street, I just hear them say something. And right away, I'm like, oh, I kind of kind of know where this person's functioning from. Like, I see where they're at. So I'm just wondering how that Works for I you. would want more than just a snippet of somebody speak because mine, I could say something that somebody else that's so ordinary, they would think I can't say something more complex. And it's automatic, yes. It's the good old, you know, something that you have learned so well and you can skip beyond it. Then I look at the, the, the connection I have with that person, that them as a human being with all their suffering, all their challenges, it's so tough. I always say it's so hard to be an adult for anybody. I, I've never met anybody who doesn't 
find it a challenge. All the expectations we have to fulfill, all the just the day to day is, is, is sometimes hard. Why should we get up even in the morning? As Robert Keegan says, the title of his book, we're in over our heads a, a lot, lot of times. Of, yes, we are. Yes, all right. we are. So besides for uh, developmental psychologists such as Eric Erickson, PHA, Jane Lavinger, uh, who are some other thinkers, teachers, and authors that most impacted your worldview? I'm, I'm so old that there's such a long list. <laughs> <laughs> Early on, I can tell you Pascal de Ponce, uh, um, uh, who else? Some teachers, really, just by the way they taught me how to see and look. I have had some fabulous teachers in art. And in, in Euro Europe, it was at that time, anyway, everybody had to take art. Whether you were any good at it or not didn't matter because seeing is such a fundamental aspect of study of any kind of research because there's always whether you look through a microscope or through a telescope you're looking and then you have to see the patterns and you have to choose which you're, which piece you're going to look at this is all stuff you also have to you can learn when you do art um, those kinds of influences. Linguistics, the, I had a professor in high school that was taught us about some Italian dialects, Swiss, Swiss Italian dialects that are so different from Italian Italian. It's just fascinating, uh, you know, things like uh, vowel harmony, that when you have an N vowel, that is a light vowel, like an E, it affects the pronunciation of what came before. And in English, I know one example of that, woman and women. Hmm. See the E, the sound in the second syllable actually affects the pronunciation of the first syllable from wo to we, women. And there are, dialects where that's consistent throughout the whole uh, language. Just fascinating things like that. Language is, oh, I love languages. <laughs> I could just talk about language, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> I feel the same way, um, you know, as I've been trying to figure out myself and my path and just language always, it, it always comes to the forefront. And then also, you know, going through a lot of what I went through and just just then realizing that the limits of language and it's like, it's this fascinating thing. And as you said at the beginning, it's like, and it's also, it has limitations. When did you come to the States? Because I don't hear an accent. I hear mine so very well. You don't hear my Brooklyn accent because people well, Brooklyn, always- Brooklyn, <laughs> but not, not Russian. Yeah, well, I, I came here a long time ago. I came where I was four and a half years old. Okay, so, so you- I, basically yeah. Up here, yeah. yeah i'm 33 I'm now yeah keenly aware of mine yeah so i guess I, I i used to have an accent when i was younger i used to get made made fun of it and that really built up quite a chip on my shoulder and played a big part of you know my story my sense making and stuff like that but but language always is just uh, it's beautiful and uh, and and again talking about loss there's fast language loss and with it the wisdom that's embedded in in them um, than any of the other losses we experience people die out and no young people learn the languages anymore the indigenous ones or very sparse efforts that i know of that that, that tries to be remedied but it Overall, it's it's almost a hopeless endeavor. I'm trying to, um, at, at home, we speak Russian because I, I still speak Russian and I'm trying to teach my sons that. When one of my sons is two years old. The other one is, oh, it's going to be seven months. So he's a little too young to speak. But 
my my two year old he speaks Russian and I just want to keep that going even though it's Good. I'm challenging. Glad. Yes, it helps just to even have a sense that there's another way of parsing reality than than English. Expands the mind. <laughs> yes. Suzanne Kagruder, uh, I'd like to honor you for your work with ego development theory, for elevating consciousness and helping humanity to discover deeper levels of truth, meaning, and wholeness. Um, thanks so much for coming on the show, and I hope we could speak sometime soon. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, it was an interesting, free-flowing kind of exchange which i always enjoy just by itself thank you for your interest and your listeners bye-bye bye-bye thanks so much suzanne